come on up and um, see me. If there are any additional students or staff who want to speak and who have not, you know, or in the moment they've decided that they want to, um, please let me know. And I'm happy to add anybody to the, the program, um, to the staff. And in just a few moments, we will get started.
lighting their candles. I can walk you through the program of events for this evening. We're gathering now and lighting candles to bring light into the Reading community after a dark three weeks with hateful speech and graffiti at the high school. We'll move to sharing our stories and emphasizing who we are at RMHS, not who we are not. And we have students and staff members who have agreed to share their stories with you tonight. We then will move to a musical a song um, led by Killian and our choral group, um, followed by Reverend Jamie Michaels, the benediction and remembrance of the victims of the Tree of Life synagogue shooting, of which this is the one week anniversary. We then will finish our evening with a recitation uh, now of three poems. We have two staff members and uh, a student, Autumn Hendrickson, who would like to finish off the evening with uh, some poetry. I have some thank yous to, to shout out, uh, which made this event uh, absolutely a possibility and happened tonight. All of the staff and students who have helped set up, who have agreed to speak, who have made signage, uh, Ms. Morello from our food service, who made hot cocoa, uh, our facilities, who um, helped uh, set up the podium, uh, to Joe Mulligan, who helped set up the stage along with all of our the PA system, Reading Police, Town, and I want to recognize Senator, State Senator Jason Lewis for joining us today as well in, um, in support of the Reading community. So thank you to everyone, to Dr. Doherty as well for his support over these last couple of weeks, which have been quite difficult here at high school. So I would like to invite our first speaker, student Eamon Longwa, up to the podium. Amen. Students, teachers, administrators, community members, good evening. I have not the adequate words. But the first fact I'd like to share with you is that today is November 3rd, 2018. And yet still, even now, anti-Semitism reminiscent of the 1940s surfaces. Even now, racism reminiscent of the 1950s surfaces. Even now, homophobia of the 1960s surfaces. Of course, I refer to Hitler's Third Reich, a civil rights movement that spanned two decades, and the riots at New York's Stonewall Inn in 1969. These are events that we, as compassionate human beings, full of, full of regret for our past actions uh, and, our, and the part that we played in a society where such hatred was tolerated would rather forget. I know that. I too would like to forget that somehow hate continues to pervade our everyday lives. That still there is prejudice, that still there is bigotry. But those who deface our desks with swastikas and who graffiti our walls and stairwells with kill the faggots amongst other words of discrimination do not forget. So we must not either. I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. These are the poignant words of Anne Frank, a believer in the Jewish faith, a teenage girl, an individual full of worth and dignity not unlike the rest of us. In February of 1945, Anne perished at the hands of a regime that believed in the superiority of an Aryan race. Unfortunately, as I read Frank's words this evening, I realize just how relevant they still are. Though there are individuals who do everything they can, everything within their power to rise above their station and to inspire change in our community, we cannot do it alone, for we are a species of collaboration. And yet, when I look around, when I look outside myself for guidance, I all too often find myself staring into a deep, dark abyss of inaction. Above me, I find the government, and I find no solace there, instead overwhelming bigotry. When I look around to some of my peers, I find little solace there either. 
Rather, I am met with act after act of inconceivable ignorance. This ignorance continues to pervade our community day after day and to label us all as the result of the actions taken by a seldom few or even one individual. I implore you to look deep within yourselves and to ask, is this what I want my generation to be remembered for? The resurgence of neo-Nazism, the hatred of entire populations, entire communities you've demonized simply because of an acronym that they were born to identify with, or because of their outermost appearance. I urge you, do not become complacent. Please disarm yourself of any and all preconceptions. Inquire this of yourself without the off-used lens of partisan bias. Strip off your labels as conservatives, independents, liberals, because these are not questions of party lines. These are questions of humanity. If you do all that, I guarantee you that the answer will be no. I do not want to be remembered for this. We do not want to be remembered for this, because we are better than this. On December 1st, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus. In short, she refused to accept the injustice that she saw and experienced in the world. We must follow her example, because justice riots at the Stonewall Inn in 1969 led to the gay rights movement of the 1970s. We too can turn this tide. Anne Frank concludes with, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty too shall end, that peace and tranquility will return once more. I believe that if we commit ourselves to the work Anne would have wanted us to do, we can change. We can eradicate ignorance and intolerance wherever we see it in our community, and we will be a better one for it. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. I'd like to invite up Assistant Principal Jess Terrio. Good evening, everyone, and thank you coming, for coming out on a cold and windy night. My name is Jessica Terrio, and I'm an Assistant Principal here at Reading Memorial High School. I am extremely disappointed that individuals in our school have acted in such a hurtful way. And I want you to know that you not only hurt your peers and the faculty, you hurt me. I want our students and faculty to be free to be who they are, free to express what they believe in, and feel comfortable in their own skin. I served this country for many years in the United States Air Force and I made that sacrifice because our freedom, your freedom, is what I hold closest to my heart. I want all people, all people, to feel respected, to feel safe, to feel loved, and to feel proud of who they are. Even though I'm not actively serving in the military anymore, I am actively serving the community of Reading and the people here in Reading Memorial High School, who I care very much about. I know that some of my students are scared, but I am not. I am strong, and I want to share my strength with you now. Back in 2004, my mentor, Mary Mastrangelo, gave me a book when I was becoming an educator. The book is called Simple Truths, Gentle Guidance on the Big Issues in Life. Mary died in November 2009 from cancer. When times get hard in my life or in the life of someone I know, I go back to this book. The one part of Mary that I still have. I'd like to read the brief section to you called On Strength. We each have a different kind of strength. Some of us are able to, do, to persevere against hopeless odds. Some are able to see the light in a world of darkness. Some are able to give selflessly with no thought of return, while others are able to bring a sense of importance into the hearts of those around them. But no matter how we exhibit strength, its truest measure is the calm and certain conviction with which it causes us to act. It is the ability to discern the path with heart, 
and follow it, even when at the moment we might wish to be doing something else. True strength is not about force, but about conviction. It lives at the center of belief where fear and uncertainty cannot gain a foothold. Its opposite is not cowardice and fear, but confusion, lack of clarity, and lack of sound intention. True strength does not require an adversary and does not see itself as noble or heroic. It simply does what it must without praise or need of recognition. A person who can quietly stay at home and care for an ailing parent is as strong as a person who can climb a mountain. A person who can stand up for a principle is as strong as a person who can fend off an army. They simply have quieter, less dramatic kinds of strength. True strength does not magnify others' weaknesses. It makes others stronger. If someone's strength makes others feel weaker, it is merely domination, and that is no strength at all. Take care to find your own true strength. Nurture it. Develop it. Share it with those around you. Let it become a light for those who are living in darkness. Remember, strength based in force is a strength people fear. Strength based in love is a strength people crave. I want you to hold your core values, our core values dear right now. Respect one another. Be responsible for your actions. Embrace scholarship to learn about that which you fear and above all persevere. Thank you. I would like to ask Autumn Hendrickson to come up to the podium. My name is Autumn Hendrickson, and I am now a junior here at RMHS. This week has been hard. This week has been heavy. This week has been long. This week has been exhausting. This past Tuesday, for the very first time in my life, I went through my school day wondering if there were kids around me who would hate me simply because I have two moms. This past Tuesday, for the very first time in my life, I worried that one of my own peers wanted my mom's death simply because they love each other. For the entire day, I switched between being distracted and wanting to cry. This past Tuesday, I realized that every time I told a Jewish friend of mine, yeah, I get that, that swastika must make me feel horrible, I really had no clue what they were feeling. Because you can't truly understand that pain until you experience it firsthand. Okay. When GSA met on Thursday, we talked a lot about what we wanted to say here tonight, not only as individuals, but as representatives of GSA. As we talked, a common theme seemed to emerge from the canvas of thoughts that we were throwing out, and that was the name of the club itself, the Gay Straight Alliance. The word alliance has always been there, right in our faces, but somehow, it took someone writing kill the faggots on a bathroom wall for us to realize just how important our allies are. For many students, simply being associated with GSA is too difficult, and that pushes them away. After the events that took place over the course of the past week, I don't think I could blame them. Now more than ever, we need allies. We need straight students and teachers to show their support for, the LGBT co for their LGBT colleagues and students. Because right now, they need you. I'm sick of hearing faggot in the halls. This is a word rooted in hate. I am sick of hearing gay thrown around like it's the. When something like what happened this week happens, everyone is affected somehow, whether they realize it or not. I watched as the light fell from many of your faces, and I watched it as it fell from my own. 
I watched as we all turned to something between robots and zombies, half dead from the pain we were carrying and half asleep from the exhaustion of all that weight, yet programmed to keep going every time the bell rang. But then something happened. Something changed. Yes, we were still tired, and yes, we were still hurting, and yes, we were still scared, but now we were angry. We were outraged, disgusted, appalled. We were reacting. There were sticky notes on all the lockers, a banner being held in the front entrance. There were people smiling at each other in the hallways. There were messages of support on classroom doors. There were kids speaking up for what they believed in. There were teachers taking time away from class to talk to us about what was happening. There were emergency club meetings and there were bridges being built and walls being torn down. Yes, we are still tired and yes, we are still hurting, and yes, perhaps we are still a bit scared, but we are here. We are together. We are a family here. Because this is Betty, and this is who we are. My first two years at RMHS were probably some of the hardest years of my life. In October of my freshman year of high school, I had been torn from one of my favorite places, also full of some of my favorite people, and I was already at a very transitional time in my life, and now it had just gotten 10 times worse, and as I reached my sophomore year, the complexity of the situation deepened even further, and there was even a small tinge of hostility to it all, whether it was imagined or real. Last year, as a sophomore, I found myself face first in the dirt more often than I would have liked to admit. But on almost every single one of those days, as I sat in my desk fighting my silent war, just as many other students were, my teachers and my classmates would help me back up whether they knew it or not. And the beauty in it all was that they didn't need to know the ins and outs of my struggles. And they didn't need to see tears rolling down my cheeks to know I was hurting. It didn't matter what had happened. The reason for my pain didn't matter. What mattered was me. They cared about me. It is for that reason that I stand here before all of you asking you to put your very best feet forward from this day on. Be the person who offers that hello in the hallway that someone didn't know they needed or who makes a small conversation with a less talkative teacher. Be the person who starts an insightful conversation with a peer who you never would have expected to be so observant and thoughtful or the friend who goes out of their way to make sure that someone knows they are loved. Be the one to make playful banter or a perfectly timed joke when you know the mood needs lightning. Because in this town and in this school, we are a family. It doesn't matter if you're gay or straight, or black or white or brown, young or old, religious or not. And we will always come together when we need to. Thank you so much, Autumn. At this time, I'd like to invite Assistant Principal Mike Sweeney up to the podium. Thank you, Ms. Boynton. Uh, my name is Mike McSweeney, and I'm the Assistant Principal here at RMHS. I'm also a proud graduate of RMHS, and that makes the events of the last few weeks and the incidents of hate we've had over the last few years very, very personal to me. Uh, I'm going to depart from my remarks for a moment just because Ms. Boynton has made a point this year of asking the adults in the building to talk about their, their why uh, and to remember and reconnect with why they became educators and got into education. Uh, and, and I stand here really almost speechless just after following um, Eamon and Autumn, who, who their words uh, and, and their passion and the intelligence and the fire they have within them and the energy, that's why I got into this. And I want to thank them and, and all the students who came tonight to be part of this and all the students will speak after me and, and my great colleague, Ms. Terrio, um, for what they've brought here this evening, and of course all of you guys for supporting us. 
like many, um, when I'm frustrated by how hard a time human beings have existing peacefully and harmoniously, I turn to the wisdom of Martin Luther King Jr. for some hope and inspiration. I want to share one bit of wisdom from Dr. King that could be helpful to our community. Dr. King urged his followers to face the fight for civil rights, and indeed all they faced in their lives, with, quote, a tough mind and a tender heart. I think we all agree on the need for a tough mind. We all agree that we shouldn't be gullible. We shouldn't believe everything we hear without thought, maybe even some skepticism. We all agree that school is a place for developing the qualities that make a tough mind. But what about a tender heart? Do we seek to develop a tender heart, or do we, as Dr. King feared, view a tender heart as weakness? Would our school be better if, even amid disagreement, we treated everyone, every student in our school, as an individual worthy of dignity and respect and love? Of course it would be better. So let's be tough-minded, but let's also be tender-hearted. Ignore those people, in fact, defy those people who would have you believe that you succeed only if someone else is made to feel threatened, intimidated, or fearful. You, the bright, promising, inspiring, passionate students of RMHS, deserve so much more. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite up student Matt Reem to the podium. Hi, my name is Matt Reem. I'm speaking here as both a as both the leader of the Gay Straight Alliance and also as a very concerned student too. And I and I think that I represent the club as a whole when I say we're tired of this. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of the constant state of anger that I'm in because of things like this happening locally and nationally. I'm tired of this school being constantly known for yet another incident of bigotry over the past year and a half. This isn't us. I know for a fact that the vast majority of students don't support ideology like this. But where are they? Are they speaking up? This is why we need people like you who have come here to this event to join us in speaking up. I know the exhaustion I feel is felt tenfold by some of my friends who have been attending and speaking at rallies like this for the past year and a half. We need the quiet majority to become loud advocates for us. Yes. Words like the ones scrawled over bathroom walls have power no matter what the intent was, but we have the power to resist them. Staying silent in the face of hateful speech is starting to near complacency at this point. To the black community, we stand with you. To the Jewish community, we stand with you. If there's anything that I've learned in the past year, it's how powerful one voice can be. So I mean it when I say this. Stand up for the truth. The time for choosing what is easy is over. I know that if you're here, you can do this. If something hateful is being said or done, call it out. Stand up with us and stand together. And over the past few weeks, there's a poem that I've come back to over and over again that pretty much illustrates the, the darkness seen here, but also offering some light. It's an excerpt from Maud by Lord Alfred Tennyson. Beat happy stars, timing with things below. Beat with my heart, more blessed than heart can tell. Blessed before some dark undercurrent of woe that seems to draw. But it shall not be so. Let all be well. Be well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. At this time, I'd like to invite our drama teacher, Ms. Natalie Kuna, up to the podium. When I was little, I remember 
were being told not to use the word hate. If I was displeased with a vegetable on my plate, my mother would say, you don't hate broccoli, you strongly dislike it. <laughs> you don't hate rainy days, they disappoint you, and you don't hate your brother, period. <laughs> and the reason that I shouldn't use the word hate was always the same. Hate is a strong word. I remember hearing that from adults over and over again. Don't say hate, it is such a strong word. And as an adult myself, I have seen my fair share of hate in my life. I have seen hate spewed in the direction of the people I love. I have seen hate keep talented people from opportunities that they deserve. And I have seen hate take more innocent lives than I ever thought I could witness in my lifetime. In all of the ways that any person could witness hate in our world, you could find a lot of evidence supporting the argument that hate is strong. It can have great power. It can oppress and intimidate. It can influence and incite and enrage. Hate and hateful acts can isolate those to whom they are directed, and it can leave lasting fear. But is that truly strength? In my experiences so far of this planet, I do not think so. You see, strength is not the ability to never fall down. It is the act of standing up when one has already fallen. Truly, you cannot learn strength, summon it, or show it if you have never been in a position of weakness. In the community of Reading, one that I have belonged to since birth, many of us have the blessing and the curse of privilege. And having privilege does not mean we do not in our own way struggle or feel pain or go through hardships. But it means that in some areas, we have the abilities and the opportunities that others do not. And as a middle class, white, straight identifying female, it took me moving out of this community and my experiencing the cultures and lives of people in different places to learn that. I do not know firsthand what it is like to be a person of color, a person whose sexual orientation or gender identification is deemed non-traditional, or a person who deals with physical or mental disability, or the many other marginalized people in our world. I do not know firsthand. My role at this school and my life before returning to RMHS have been in the theater. And what I have learned in a lifetime of acting is that we do not need to know firsthand what something is to learn about it. What we are required to do as human beings in this life is to imagine what it could be like. That is all that we need to do, sometimes to make lasting change. Because if I can imagine what your struggles are like, and you can imagine mine, we have created empathy, we have created respect, and we have manifested a human connection. Words can be strong, but a dialogue can make a difference. We need to decide as a community here and now if we celebrate strength or if we accept our own weaknesses. We cannot look to those who struggle to guide us through these moments. We need, as a community, to feel empowered to make the changes this school needs to be better. If we say that this is not who we are, then we need to show it. We need to remember that the weak voices of a tiny few cannot drown out the strong, raised voices of many. Yes. We need to be allies and advocates and not hide behind the statement, this is for attention. It is. But we need to realize that our attention is not so easily gained. The strength and perseverance that I see in those targeted by hate in our community is inspiring. That is the championship spirit I know this school can and should radiate. We are athletes and academics and artists, all striving for greatness. Now that I am the adult, I will tell you this. Hate is not a strong word. It is cowardice and weakness at its core. Hope, love, kindness, in the face of hate, that is strength.
Are we strong enough? Thank you so much, Ms. Kuna. I would like to invite Ms. Holly Shore up to the podium.
and that's because, and it makes us look like a community full of hate. And if you would ask anyone outside of here, what does our region look like and what does writing look like, they might say, you guys look like a racist town. And that's not who we are. But the thing about that is that the people who are, are spreading hate, they have the loudest voices. That's just how it is. So what we need to do is be louder than them and say, this is not OK. together to create a community that has zero tolerance for any of these things happening. Simple being drawn, offensive jokes. The more we normalize these minor incidents, the problem gets worse. There will always be incidents, though. The graffiti won't stop. We can't tell the people to stop. We don't know what their motives are. But if there are always incidents like this, then there always needs to be upstanders fighting against them. Part of the tragedy in Nazi Germany was that intolerance was met with silence, with indifference. That's why it is essential that we respond as individuals and as a community. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to thank you so much, Todd. At this time, I'd like to invite you know, one of our English teachers, Mr. Zach Brokenbrook, to the podium. I just want to start by thanking you all so much for being here this evening, as well as Dr. Doherty, uh, Ms. Boynton, and our assistant principals for creating a space for this moment to exist. I don't know about you, when I was in high school, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, we would not be here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Zach Brokenrope, and I'm an English teacher here at the high school. And for the past five years, I have had the privilege of walking through those doors every day of work. And that time, Many of you have entrusted me with what I consider to be the greatest honor of my life, to mentor and teach your kids. In my years as an educator, I have always believed in the importance of being open and honest with my students. For me, a part of that means that I've always been openly out as a gay man in my classroom, a position that I take devoid of any political stance other than my fundamental right to exist as a person. I came out at uh, 14 on November 3rd, 2004, 14 years ago tonight. At 28, that means that as of this evening, I have lived half of my life as an openly gay man. The significance of this has not been lost on me this past week as I have reflected on how I got here, where I come from, and where I hope we're going as a community. I grew up in a farming town in rural Nebraska, a state that at least twice a year my kids refer to as Alaska. <laughs> And a state to where this day, many of my LGBTQ friends live in fear of being fired for who they openly are. I don't need to tell you what it was like to grow up gay there in the early 2000s. I don't need to recount the violence or the isolation or the anger or the fear or the loss of friends or family or church. But what did happen there then? led me to a cornfield on a cold December day when I was 15, where I placed a revolver in my mouth, and I pulled the trigger. And as you can tell by my presence here tonight, I'm one of the fortunate ones. Either by luck or fate, I lived. And the moments after, I decided that my life was worth living. But that the only way for me to ensure my survival was to find a place where people could hate people like me the way they did in my hometown. The place where I was born, the place where I grew up, on the streets and roads that I knew every day. That was a year after your state legalized gay marriage. And for the remaining years of my high school experience, I made it my singular vision to make this place my home. This past week, after incident after incident of racism and anti-Semitism and homophobia has continued to find the narrative of this community. I keep thinking about a moment from my first year of college in 2008 when I was walking down Newberry Street with another student I had met as part of an LGBTQ organization on campus. It was after sunset and a car pulled up to us on the side of the road and began to roll their windows down. By instinct, I dropped my bag and ran and walked. 
when my friend caught up to me, panting out of breath, he asked me what I was doing, where I was going, and I told him that I thought we were going to be attacked. That was normal. That's what I'd grown up expecting. He looked at me, and for a second, I saw this like glimmer of heartbreak in his eyes, and he wrapped his arms around me and told me that I didn't have to run anymore. It was the first time in four years I had felt sick. I've lived my life by that creed ever since. I will not run from the face of intolerance or hatred or injustice. I will not cower in the dark and disappear. In the great arc of history, Boston has often been called a city on a hill, a shining beacon of hope for the best of what this country is and the best of what this country can be. And while we have not always lived up to that creed, we have tried to lead the way, whether it be in education or in civil rights or in health care. But while we may aim for the stars, the battle for what is right is fought on an imperfect earth. We do not get to choose our moral imperatives. We do not get to choose the times in our life where we must be courageous above all else, where we risk the comfort of the many, the battle for the lives and the dignity of the few. Those moments come to us. In the past year, the past month, the past week, they have came to this town, to this school, into our classrooms. Those imperatives have come to you. The story that I shared with you tonight is a single story of this community, but it's far from the only one. I cannot begin to think of what this past week has been like for others, for our queer students now, for our Jewish families, for our people of color that walk through these halls and these streets every day. But 14 years ago tonight, I started the journey that led me to this place. When I closed my eyes and I remember that 15-year-old boy, the one who dreamed of the idea of what his life could be, of a place he had never been, whose beaches he had never walked on, whose roads he had never driven, and whose people he had never met, I am filled with renewed sense of urgency to fight for that idea. Yeah. Yeah. To fight for a place where our children and young people will know they have a right to exist. Yes. I'm not 14 anymore. <laughs> I'm not a kid anymore. The duty to protect and to create and to push forward is ours now and it lies with us. And we live this every day for the students of color across this country, for the gay students across this country, not just in this community, but to be a beacon, a city on a hill once again. I will not run. We will not run. Yes. And I have chosen to stay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bernardino. Hi, hello. Um, today, I wasn't even 100% sure that I was going to be here tonight um, because my parents were afraid that if I came here, I would never come home. Um, they, it's a time now where we live our lives wondering if we're the kind of person that someone hates and that someone might be plotting against. That it's a world where there's, there's just so much fear within us. But I want you to know that I came here tonight and all of you came here tonight. And I'm so proud of all of you. And I thank you for coming, for standing up, for being here and lighting your candles and existing as part of this community because all of us, we live our own lives and our own existence, living our own struggles with our own identities, but we walk, but we are all members of this community. We all walk these streets, we go to these schools, we go to these businesses because all of us are people and we all have dreams and we all have identities and we all have people we love and people who love us. And I want you to know that every, everyone here, regardless of your ethnicity, of your, of your identity, you are valid, you are brave, and I'm proud of you for coming to school every day, for coming here and being able to stand here tonight. I stand here as a member of the LGBT plus community and as someone that struggles with mental health issues. And there are so many times where you get up in the morning and you think that you can't do it, that it's so hard that maybe you don't even deserve to get up that morning. 
but you do because you know that you have a community that will be here for you and that you are strong and that the hate cannot overcome you because you are more than just a label. You're more than just a slur or a picture or a word. You are a person with an identity and a life and a heart. And people say that it's just a word, it's just a picture. Why, why does it matter? But the thing is, it matters so much because each of us have lived through so many hardships. We, so many people have had slurs thrown at them, have faced abuse, have faced struggles in their lives. And maybe to some people it's just a picture or it's just a word, but to some people it's a triggering flashback of a memory of a time when they didn't feel safe and when they didn't feel like they could be themselves. So each day that we know, know that we are here, that people who are standing here tonight are here for you and that we are a community and we will stay strong. Thank you. every morning. And every morning at 5 o'clock, I wake him up and I tell him it's time to go to school. My daughter graduated from here some years ago. And she used to come home and tell me that she felt that it was racist. And I used to say, why well, don't that way when I come out there? And I look around at what I see today to be strength. And yes, I know racism exists, and I know hate exists. And I grew up in a household where that wasn't allowed. We didn't hate, we loved each other. I put my son on the bus every morning, and I turn on the news, and I hear about school shooting, and all the violence around us. And I feel scared. A few years ago, when there was a threat written on the bathroom wall, my first instinct was to take my child out of school, find another district. But with it being everywhere, where would you send him? You have to keep him home. And that's not the answer. So I chose to leave him in the school where he was happy, with a town that surrounded him with love, and I choose tonight and many more nights to stand with not just a community, with not just friends, but with family and say no more. Yes. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite the choral group to come on up and gather on stage and they'll be performing a song for you. I'll let the student introduce what song it is and the and Miss Terry will be joining them as well in song. I often sneak into their seat rock class and stand by autumn and sing with them also and I'll go. I have not sung this song before, so I'll go and mess it up. But this is Miss Killian asked me to read this. Um, today is going to be a good day and here is why. Because today today at least you're you and that's enough. Dear Evan Hansen, and the song is you will be fine. So we should take a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
comes crashing through when you need a friend to carry you and when you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again lift your head and look around you here 
Um, last night, I sat at a Solidarity Shabbat service. It was one of hundreds, thousands of Shabbat services, Friday night services that were held all around the country where um, Jewish communities opened up their doors to reclaim safe space in their sacred spaces that now felt unsafe because of the, the threats, the violence, the massacre of the past week, right? And so this week, um, instead of closing off in fear, Jewish communities opened their doors and invited people of all faiths to join them in solidarity. And so I'm so proud of all of you tonight for standing up and doing the same thing here in this space, saying that this space is not a place where we will say yes to hate, it is a place where we will say yes to love and to strength and to solidarity. And so we're so glad that you're here tonight. You had some really, really brave um, teachers and staff and faculty stand up here and tell you, remind you really, right, that we cannot know one another's stories fully. And so it's really important for us to listen to each other. So I'm here to commit to you, to promise to you that the Reading Clergy Association and all of the churches and worship spaces in town and Reading Embraces Diversity and all of the organizations that we are associated with and all of the people who have come to join us are here to do our work. We are here to do our work so that all of the spaces in town, not just your school, but that all of the places in town can continue to be a safe place for you to live and grow and breathe and do all of the things that you're supposed to be doing right now. We are here to do our work. And so I'm so glad that uh, Pastor Kyung is here with me. And we would like to um, invite you into a moment of prayerful reflection. And um, it's an interfaith prayer. And so I invite you, um, however you name God or the divine or whatever this, the sense is, the spirit is that is bigger than yourself, I invite you to, um, to be in that spirit. And right after that, right after this prayer, we're going to um, enter into a time of remembrance of the folks who were um, who were killed at the Tree of Life Synagogue last week. When I was at the Solidarity Shabbat last night, one of the first things that we did was remember that not only were 11 people killed at the Tree of Life Synagogue, but that two black folks, Maurice E. Stallard and Vicki Lee Jones, were killed at a supermarket last week because they were black. And I thought it was such an act of courage for the Jewish community to name a community with which they were in solidarity and mourning too. And so I want us to take their example as we enter into this time of prayer. Will you pray with us? Grant us peace, your most precious gift. O God, eternal source of peace, and give us the will to proclaim this message to our families, our friends, our community, and our whole world. Holy One, bless this school and this community and safeguard them with peace. Make them be a beacon of hope and a light of love, shining forth a new way for all who languish in despair and loneliness. May contentment reign in our hearts and in our relationships, health and happiness within our homes. Strengthen the bonds of friendship and fellowship among all the inhabitants of every land. Remind us that we were made for each other. Remind us that we were made for each other. Plant virtue in every soul. And may your love hallow every home and every heart. Amen. Amen. Invite up now uh, Anne and Janice, who are members of Reading and Races Diversity, who will help us to remember the, the names of the 11 people, that, the lives of the 11 people who were killed last week. Thank you, Jamie. I also want to invite up those people that we ask to say a name to come up forward, please. Janice Grant Menace. And I'm Ann Schwartz. We are both parents of our Menace students, members of the Reading Jewish community, and 
high numbers of Reading and Grace's diversity, or RED. To honor the 11 victims from the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, we take inspiration from the Jewish traditions of lighting candles and the Havdal ceremony. Candles play a big part in Jewish traditions. The medieval scholar Rabbi Rashi explains, without light, there can be no peace, because people will constantly stumble. In Jewish tradition, the candle's flame also symbolizes the human soul and serves as a reminder of the frailty and beauty of life. Havdalah, which in Hebrew means separation, is a Jewish religious ceremony that marks the end of the Sabbath, which is after sundown on Saturday, right now, and ushers in the new week. The ritual involves lighting a special candle, looks like this, with several wicks, blessing a cup of wine, and smelling spices. We are not performing a traditional Havdalah ceremony tonight, but we will use the Havdalah candles symbolically, which are braided, and they represent that we are all intertwined. The braided candle has multiple wicks and gives off a stronger light than a candle with only a single wick also symbolizing unity and strength. The Havdalah ceremony acknowledges our abilities as human beings to make distinctions in our lives, dividing light and darkness, separating the Sabbath from the rest of the week, and for our purposes tonight, ending hate and moving forward to acceptance, love, respect, and hope. For the purposes of this memorial, we will light these special Havdalah candles to represent the 11 victims who were murdered in Pittsburgh. After we recite each name, please say together, we remember. Julius Feinberg. We remember. Melvin Wax. We remember. Bernice Simon. We remember. David Rosenthal. We remember. Irving Younger. We remember. Zillin. Simon. We remember. Daniel Stein. We remember. Jerry Rabinowitz. We remember. Rosenthal. We remember. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness 
cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that.
Mass General Hospital, and and um, NPR, I know it's a cliche, uh, and NPR was having an interview with uh, Sir Ben Kingsley um, about the subject of the uh, imminent premiere of the new film called Operation Finale, which is the tale of the, the pursuit of Nazi fiend and war criminal Adolf Eichmann by the uh, Israeli intelligence service into Argentina in 1961. And uh, Kingsley, who is most famously remembered play, uh, for playing Mahatma Gandhi 35 years ago, one of the most beloved and saintly people of modern times, was playing the man, Adolf Eichmann, who saw the operation of the trains that brought Jews and other perceived inferiors and undesirables to death camps such as Auschwitz and Treblinka and Majdanek and Chelno and Sobibor and, um, and Sobibor. And um, he was talking about how he came to create the role of Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann, by the way, unlike many of the um, higher echelon of the Nazi regime, escaped and captured by the Allies at the end of the war and made it out of uh, Germany. And, uh, Kid under lived in under an assumed name and identity um, for the next 16 years and was finally captured in 1961 and brought back to Israel where he was faced he was put on trial for crimes against humanity and genocide and was found guilty and hanged and his body was cremated and the ashes dumped in the Mediterranean Sea because the Israeli people didn't want his ashes polluting Jewish soil. Um, uh, Kingsley talked about his friendship with Elie Wiesel, who was one, probably one of the most famous uh, survivors of the Holocaust, and uh, Wiesel wrote a poem for him, and here it is. Let us tell tales. Let us tell tales. All the rest can wait. All the rest must wait. Let us tell tales. That is our primary obligation. Commentaries will have to come later, lest they replace or be cloud what they mean to reveal. Tales of children so wise and so old. Tales of old men mute with fear. Tales of victims welcoming death as an old acquaintance. Tales that bring man close to the abyss and beyond, and others that lift him up to heaven and beyond. Tales of despair. Tales of longing, tales of immense flames reaching out to the sky, tales of night consuming life and hope and eternity. Let us tell tales so as to remember how vulnerable man is when faced with overwhelming evil. Let us tell tales so as not to allow the executioner to have the last word. The last word belongs to the victim. It is up to the witness to capture it, shape it, transmit it, and keep it as a secret, and then communicate that secret to others. Elie Wiesel. Thank you very much. This poem properly sums up why all of us are standing here. So I will leave you with the poem Equality by Maya Angelou. You declare you see me dimly through a glass which will not shine, though I stand before you boldly, trim and rank and making time. You do own to hear me faintly as a whisper out of range while my drums beat out the message and the rhythms never change. Equality, and I will be free. Equality, and I will be free. You announce my ways are wanton, that I fly from man to man, but if I'm just a shadow to you, could you ever understand we have lived a painful history. We know the shameful past, 
but I keep on marching forward and you keep on coming last. Equality, and I will be free. Equality, and I will be free. Take the blinders from your vision, take the padding from your ears, and confess you've heard me crying and admit you've seen my tears. Hear the tempo so compelling, hear the blood throb through my veins. Yes, my drums are beating nightly, and the rhythms never change. Equality, and I will be free. Equality, and I will be free. Thank you, Alan. I want to thank every single one of you for coming out tonight to stand up for such an important cause, to stand up for Reading Memorial High School, for the town of Reading, for the community of Reading, to say that this is who we are. Yes. Yes. This is what we stand for. Moving forward. That's right. I have one last quote from Nelson Mandela, who is a hero of mine. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Thank you all for coming tonight.